Hello and welcome to today's broadcast, AF4MALS, a powerful tool for the characterization of biomacromolecules and colloid particles. My name is Lindsay East. I'm the marketing manager for Wyatt Technology and I will host this event. Today's speaker is Professor Lars Nilsson from Lund University. Professor Nielsen has a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from Lund University, Sweden, and a Master's of Science in Food Science from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He earned his PhD at Lund University in 2007, working with the absorption of macromolecules during emulsification. At the start of his PhD work, he came in contact with AF4 as he worked on the characterization of macromolecules macromolecular emulsifiers. During his PhD student years, he also worked with Professor Carl Gustav Volland at Lund University. In 2010, he was awarded the Axo Nobel Nordic Prize in Surface and Colloid Chemistry for his work on macromolecular emulsifiers. Professor Nielsen is also the founder of a spin-off company, Solve Research and Consultancy, where he spends a minor part of his time. Solve offers, among other things, AF4 and SEC MALS method development and analyses, as well as dynamic light scattering as a service. He is currently Associate Professor in Food Technology at Lund University. So now, please allow me to wel welcome Professor Lars Nilsson. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for that nice uh, introduction and uh, as was mentioned I would like to talk about the characterization of biomacromolecules and colloid particles and especially in in food related systems but also some other systems. Um, in food systems we typically have a range of different uh, macromolecules present. These can be dissolved macromolecules uh, such as polysaccharides, starch, fibers, gums, etc. Uh, these species are typically highly polydispersed because they are natural polymers uh, and they often contain very high molar mass species and often we talk about ultra high molar mass and that means then roughly uh, a molar mass above uh, 10 million grams per mole. The other large group of dissolved macromolecules are then the proteins which is of course a great variety of different uh, proteins. But to complicate things even further, uh, many food systems are colloidal dispersions. So we might also have uh, insoluble dispersed particles present. And these can then consist of, for instance, protein aggregates with varying degrees of solubility. Uh, these can be lipid vesicles that are dispersed. In formulated foods and in some natural foods, we also have the presence of um, oil droplets that are dispersed, so emulsion droplets. Um, and, of course, also we can have uh, dietary fibers, uh, which can also uh, be present as insoluble particles. Um, the properties uh, of these uh, species influence their functionality in many foods. And with functionality, we typically talk about uh, rheology, uh, so texture control uh, of the food systems, the colloidal stability, so to avoid uh, flocculation or uh, sedimentation uh, of, of these uh, species. It can also involve encapsulation to protect uh, ingredients from the uh, external environment um, and also then of course using uh, these macromolecules as emulsifiers to stabilize oil droplets in, in dispersion. They also play a role for nutritional properties and of course then further to tailor the, the, the properties of these macromolecules, there is also an interest in the plant breeding to be able to evaluate uh, the, the different macromolecules present. And there is a great demand to be able to design the functionality. With functionality it can mean both nutritional properties or the, the texture and rheology uh, stability, etc. And this uh, makes it very complicated because we have this uh, mixed matrix and it also puts a great demand on the characterization methods uh, that we need to use to be able to assess uh, these properties. 
um, one of the tools that we use very frequently um, to address these challenges is asymmetric flow field flow fractionation, or more commonly known as uh, uh, AF4. Um, AF4 is a chromatography-like uh, separation method. It is not chromatography, however, but there are many similarities to chromatography, and also the instrumentation has uh, similarities. So hence we used to refer to it as, as a chromato chromatography-like uh, separation method. Um, basically what we have in AF4 is a channel that is pictured here. It uh, has a length of something in the range between 10 to 30 centimeters, uh, and a height of typically in the order of a couple of hundred uh, uh, microns. At the bottom of this channel is placed an ultrafiltration membrane, as is shown here, um, and liquid is pumped through this channel, through the channel flow inlet over here, um, and then that flow continues down the channel here. Some of this flow is allowed to exit through the ultrafiltration membrane and the remainder of the flow will continue in the longitudinal direct, uh, direction towards the outlet of the channel and out, uh, ultimately then to some type of detectors. Uh, the sample to be separated is typically injected a little bit downstream in the setup that we used, or different setups, but this is, this is uh, one of the more common. Um, it is injected into the uh, flow that goes along the channel and becomes relaxed due to the cross flow that then exits through the ultrafil ultra, sorry, ultrafiltration membrane. Um, as this cross flow that is indicated here acts in this direction, it forces the sample alanites down towards the ultrafiltration membrane. This in turn is counteracted by diffusional transport uh, due to Brownian motion of the analytes. Uh, counteracting the, the transport that drives it down through the ultrafiltration membrane. When we have steady state in these conditions, we then get a characteristic concentration profile, as is pictured here in, in this uh, figure. Uh, and when that re uh, relaxation has been achieved, the sample is allowed to start the migration along the channel down towards the outlet to the detectors. The, the characteristic distance in the concentration profile away from the ultrafiltration membrane will thus be determined from the cross-flow induced transport and the diffusional transport. So basically, uh, species or analytes that have a higher diffusion coefficient will on average be situated further away from uh, the ultrafiltration membrane, while larger species with um, um, a lower diffusion coefficient will be situated uh, closer to uh, the ultrafiltration membrane. That in turn means that the analytes that are situated closer to the ultrafiltration membrane will experience a lower flow velocity along the channel compared to the ones that are situated further away from the ultrafiltration membrane. And hence, these particles here, or analytes here, that are situated further away will move faster along the channel down towards the detector and the other example here will move slower and thus we have obtained then uh, size-based um, separation. So this is then based on hydrodynamic size, the hydrodynamic radius or if you like diffusion coefficient depending on how you describe it. Um, then by using different detectors, typically what we work with them would be multi-angle light scattering and differential refractive index, we can then obtain uh, a range of uh, different uh, parameters for the sample. There are some advantages to uh, the AF4 method, it is a very gentle separation mechanism, we have low shear forces, uh, relatively low operating pressures, uh, and the low shear forces and low pressures originate also from the absence of uh, uh, packing as compared to a packed column in size solution chromatography, for instance. Uh, fraction collection is rather easy, so if one wants to use it in a preparative um, or semi preparative mode, the fractions of the analyte can be uh, collected and used for further analysis. We can also use a range of different um, uh, buffers or, or solutions to separate our samples in and thus have close to uh, native environment for the samples. 
due to the low shear forces and, uh, and the gentle separation mechanisms, we can also uh, fractionate very fragile samples, let's say aggregated polymer structures and so on. And another benefit is then that we can also obtain uh, separation in a very large uh, size range. So this is what a typical instrumental setup would look like. Uh, we have a LC system over here that generates the, the flows through the pump and handles the uh, sample injection. Um, we have then the separation channel uh, down here, where is the, the one that was pictured in the previous slide, where the actual separation takes place. Uh, and in this illustration, then we have the uh, AF4 uh, box here, which is uh, and uh, is then called the, the clips here. And um, basically, this contains a number of valves that controls uh, the different flows, uh, the cross flow and the, the 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 injection flows and so on. So this is basically a flow handling uh, unit. We then have a multi-angle light scattering detector uh, over here which we then can obtain uh, different parameters from, as you will see, and also a refractive index detector for the concentration uh, determination in the eluting fractions. So what properties can we then obtain from this? We can obtain the root mean square radius from directly from the multi-angle light scattering data, um, and the uh, root mean square radius, also called the radius of gyration, is not necessarily uh, the, the the same. It, well, it is not the same as the geometrical radius. I'll try to depict it here. It is basically the average distance of every uh, mass unit in the object to the center of gravity of the object. Uh, if we then combine the mass data with um, refractive index data, we can then obtain the molar mass. How this is performed, I will not go through because that will take the, the rest of the webinar, um, I think. Um, but anyway, we, by combining these two detectors, we can obtain the molar mass. And we can then also obtain the diffusion coefficient for each eluting uh, component uh, directly from the retention times, as the retention time in the separation is based on uh, the diffusion coefficient. And this can, depending on the flow conditions and how this is performed, um, uh, become a little bit of a complicated uh, calculation, but it can nevertheless be uh, solved numerically. And the interesting thing, except obtaining the hydrodynamic radius, which is then calculated from the Stokes-Einstein equation, is that we can combine this with the root mean square radius uh, and then obtain some conformational uh, or shape information for our analytes. Uh, and another interesting property that can also be um, obtained from combining the different measures here is an apparent density of the analytes, which also gives some uh, type of information of, yeah, obviously the density, but also the conformation of the eluting analytes. And these, so these are typically measures that we utilize in the characterization of our samples. So I will go on to talk about some examples and applications that we work on or have worked on. Uh, I will start to talk a little bit about the structure and properties of serial beta-glucan, um, which will then follow, uh, be followed by the hydrolysis of Levan, which is uh, a fructan polymer, and how we have used AF4 to tailor make, uh, to evaluate the processing to tailor make the properties of this Levan for from applications. Um, as you heard already in the introduction, I work quite a bit on macromolecular, ma macromolecular emulsifiers, and um, I have some few examples that I would like to talk about. Hydrophobically modified starch, uh, acacia gum, which is a natural surface active gum, uh, also known as gum arabic, uh, and also oat proteins uh, and their emulsifying properties. Um, some few words about lipid dispersions, um, phospholipid vesicles, and which are produced from uh, homogenization of phospholipids, but also um, uh, low-density lipoprotein, which is a naturally occurring lipid aggregate in, uh, for instance, egg yolk. And finally, some uh, words about uh, contract analysis and uh, what, what the guys at uh, Sol Research and Consultancy do. 
So we'll start with some uh, examples from the effects of processing on serial beta-glucan and its uh, molar mass distributions. Serial beta-glucan is a soluble fiber uh, that is uh, present in rather high amounts in oat and barley, also to a lesser extent in rye and wheat. Uh, soluble is um, a matter of definition. Uh, many people consider it to be uh, quite soluble, but um, it is in fact also um, present as a supramolecular aggregates. Um, and as uh, a 1, 3 and uh, 1, 4 beta linkage respectively, so we have blocks of uh, 1, 3 linkages which are then uh, now and then interrupted in the chain by a 1, 3 linkage. And this makes it slightly different from cellulose, which is only the beta-1,4 linkage, and it's also which uh, imparts uh, partial uh, aqueous solubility for uh, the polymer. It is associated with beneficial health effects, lower glucose and insulin responses. Um, these effects are believed to be related to the viscosity-enhancing properties of the uh, polymer. Uh, it is often stated that it is due to or related to the molecular weight, so high molecular weight is supposed to be uh, uh, beneficial for these effects, and also it, it is attributed to uh, how soluble these um, polymers are. And the question mark is just that there, there are uh, uh, other, uh, could be other uh, properties of the polymer that also affects its, um, its functionality. And as I've already said, when it's dissolved in water, we don't only get a solution of them, we also get macromolecular aggregates very easily. And in literature, these aggregates are considered to be very important. It is often not clearly stated uh, how this relates to the, the functionality, but aggregates are believed to be uh, important for the properties. Um, one thing we were initially interested in was if filtration of our solutions or dispersions of the beta-glucan uh, would affect uh, the, the, the size distribution that we would obtain. Uh, these species are commonly analyzed by SCC and there it's uh, common practice to uh, filter uh, the sample before injection. So we wanted to compare, here's an example, this is an A4 fractogram, here we have the elution time from the channel, this axis shows the molar mass of our eluting species and this is um, the detector signals here, which are then uh, shown as a multi-angle light scattering signal and uh, a refractive index signal. This was a rather small uh, barley beta-glucan, 359,000 grams per mole. Um, it's a standard substance, so it's, it's highly pure. Uh, so we took a very coarse, uh, or should, should I say, a, a standard filter to filtrate these uh, solutions and um, we would of course expect not uh, to lose too much of it as is this rather low molecular weight compared to the uh, quite large uh, pore size in our membrane. Um, and here we see then the unfiltered and the filtered sample. If we look at the refractive index signal here for both uh, samples, the filter and unfiltered, we can see that nothing is really lost as we would expect due to the filtration, and there's not a, a large change in the signal uh, at all. If we look at the multi-angle light scattering part, on the other hand, we can see that um, the unfiltered sample, which has the mass trace here, uh, is, is somewhat changed when we move to the, the filtered sample over here. Uh, so even though we do not lose material, it appears that uh, the properties are somewhat changed. And that is also manifested then if we look at the molar mass trace of, uh, as a function of evolution time, which we have the two uh, traces here, the unfiltered one and here the filtered one. And we can see that even though we don't lose material, as I said, we still have a, a slight change in, in, the, in the size of the material and also a shift in slope here. And as the slope is related to uh, the hydrodynamic radius, we can see that uh, the, the conformational properties of this material is slightly uh, changed uh, due to the filtration. 
So we don't lose material, but the action uh, of filtration as such uh, uh, induces a slight uh, change in the properties. So even though a, a relatively small polymer, a relatively large pore-sized membrane, uh, we still ob uh, observe this um, a slight change in properties. So filtration is always a, a risky operation uh, as if you believe that it does not affect the sample. We were interested in how processing uh, affects uh, our uh, sample uh, and here are some different examples. If we start on the left, uh, we here looked at uh, uh, heating of our uh, solutions. So here we have uh, rather uh, low heating, so one that was dissolved uh, below 100 degrees and the reference and then we heated uh, at 100 degrees for a number of uh, minutes. And we can see that no real change uh, occurs in the material, in the molar mass trace here. So this uh, makes seem, it seems that it's relatively unaffected. If we then go on to autoclaving temperatures instead, so 120 degrees uh, for different times, we can already see that we get a drastic change in the uh, refractive index signal here, so basically the concentration, where we shift to shorter uh, elution times, uh, meaning, of course, that the uh, analytes have become smaller. And this is also then uh, manifested in the uh, molar mass trace for these peaks. So we get a change if we heat it uh, more than that. Um, this could either be that we disrupt the supramolecular aggregates, uh, and it could also be due to that we see a degradation uh, in, in the molecules. Um, and that's what, what generates this uh, lower hydrodynamic size and shorter elution times. The figure on the right shows uh, freezing of the solutions. Um, we have a reference sample that is uh, not frozen then, and then we have another uh, sample that was frozen, kept frozen at, uh, for one week, and we don't observe any major uh, differences in, in the, uh, the molar mass distribution. However, if we freeze thaw cycle uh, the, the, the sample, so it's, it's frozen and it's thawed and then frozen again, and this is repeated a number of times, we get uh, not so much a change in the elution profile in the refractive index plot here, but we see that at a given elution time, we have a considerable change in molar mass. So this was before it was frozen in the reference sample, and if we then look at the freeze toss cycle sample, we can see at, that in the same, at the same elution time, i.e. the same hydrodynamic size, we have uh, a much higher, uh, several orders of magnitude higher molar mass in our analytes. So it appears that we induce uh, an aggregation from this free, freeze thaw cycling, and the objects become much denser because we have a much higher molar mass contained in the same uh, hydrodynamic size. So that much about uh, beta-glucans. Uh, now I will talk uh, a little bit about uh, tailoring the size and molar mass of levan through hydrolysis. Uh, levan is a, a polymer with a fr uh, fructose backbone and it has also some short branches which are typically one to two fructose units long. Uh, it gives rise to Newtonian flow behavior uh, when it's dissolved, and this occurs even at rather high concentrations. And this is, of course, very unusual for uh, um, a polymer where you would expect the flow behavior to be cytoplastic at uh, already at uh, relatively low concentrations. So this gives it uh, somewhat unusual properties. It also forms aggregates in solution and uh, we were originally approached by our collaborators in this work because they had tried uh, in many ways to separate uh, this material with uh, SEC but had been unsuccessful and wanted to give uh, AF4 uh, a try. And we did. Uh, and here are some examples of these results. On the right here we see uh, the molar mass as a function of retention time, this is the red trace, and uh, here we see the uh, RMS radius, which is the blue trace. 
the dashed line is the mouse signal and the solid line here is the um, refractive index uh, signal. Uh, so we can see at uh, low retention times we have a rather high concentration but the species are so small that we get a very weak uh, mouse signal. And that also then results in that we are not able to determine the RMS radius at these uh, lower retention times. However, the molar mass can still be determined uh, uh, at, at these uh, uh, small sizes. So we have material here that range roughly between uh, 200,000 up to about 100 million. Uh, and if we look at the uh, right figure, uh, here is plotted then the ratio between the two radii, so the hydrodynamic radius here is obtained from the retention times and the, uh, the root mean square radius is obtained from uh, the light scattering detector. We are then not able to analyze this peak with this uh, particular setup, but the uh, large molecular weight material uh, we are able to tell something about the conformation. And here we have conformation values which are roughly what you would expect for uh, a sphere for the large part of the material here. So we have something that is relatively spherical and dense uh, in this range. And we can also see that we have a decaying density uh, over this peak. So the apparent, apparent density decays with retention time and thus decays uh, with size. So we were well able to separate this uh, material with the AF4. What we then went on, and I will uh, just show this very briefly, uh, there was a lot of experiments that gone in, went in to uh, hydrolyze this material in order to obtain, uh, to be able to, to tailor the, the, the properties that's, that our collaborators were uh, looking for. This, this material is produced uh, uh, in, in different ways and often the molecular weight becomes very high and uh, depending on the application they would like to hydrolyze it to, to change its properties. And here is an example where it's hydrolyzed at pH 2.6 for uh, up to two hours. And um, what is plotted here is for the large uh, molar mass fraction, the molar mass here, and here we have again the ratio of the material, uh, sorry, the, the ratio between the two radii describing the conformation of the material. And as we move in this plot downwards here between the different uh, curves here, the hydrolysis time is increasing. And similarly in the right plot we have then again the molar mass and also the, uh, instead the density uh, plotted on this other axis and again as we move this way uh, the hydrolysis time is increasing. Uh, what we can see is that um, we lose some of the large material naturally as we uh, we do this hydrolysis, but we can see see that for for the kind of intermediate uh, hydrolysis times the, the conformational properties remain rather similar with, uh, within the sample. So even though it becomes smaller, it retains uh, its um, its conformational properties, which suggests that there is uh, some sort of structured. Uh, hydrolysis pattern uh, going on rather than some sort of random breakdown of the material. And we combine this then with, with the sugar analysis by HPLC for instance and we can then could then also uh, try to work out uh, some sort of hypothetical uh, pattern for how this hydrolysis occurs uh, and it appears then that initially we don't see um, any real production of oligosaccharides or, or fructose monomers, but rather it appears that the large aggregates that we start with uh, are broken up to smaller pieces, but which have a similar uh, conformation within them as the large aggregate has. So we have some sort of division into uh, self-similar smaller uh, objects. Eventually then we do see a change, and that could then be that we are producing the low molecular weight leaven and as we allow the hydrolysis to continue and go on, um, we then uh, obtain uh, oligosaccharides and eventually also of course uh, we have a lot of production of the uh, monomer which is then the fructose molecule. So by doing this we were able to tailor um, how, at which pH and how long this um, this uh, hydrolysis should continue in order to obtain the, the um, desired properties for the application. 
we move on to talk a little bit about macromolecular emulsifiers, and these are specifically for different types of uh, food emulsions. Um, uh, the classic macromolecular emulsifier is then uh, gamma arabic, as I uh, already mentioned, uh, and gamma arabic has been used for, to stabilize uh, emulsions and dispersions for uh, a very long time. Um, it is naturally uh, surface active, and it has a very complex uh, uh, chemical structure. It's highly branched and based on arabinogalactan. Um, there is also a fraction that has a, a protein associated with it, which is then the arabinogalactan protein. Uh, and this is important for the surface activity and the emulsification because the polysaccharide in itself is not really uh, surface active. And in the specific study here where we'll talk about, we wanted them to compare the emulsifying properties between gamma arabic and mesquite gum. Um, another macromolecular emulsifier that has uh, become popular is a hydrophobically modified starch, so basically starch to which octanyl succinic anhydride has been grafted. And through uh, grafting this uh, octanyl chain, we then have a hydrophobic moiety here and we obtain um, surface activity. Uh, one reason for this is, of course, that gamma arabic is a rather expensive uh, emulsifier. It is complicated in many ways. Uh, the the uh, supply of it can vary greatly and also the properties uh, tends to vary. And it also is known for having an aging effect, so its properties change uh, rather drastically over time. So uh, the OSA starch has become a, a popular alternative to this for its more uh, predictable uh, properties. I should also mention that the, for food applications, the uh, degree of substitution in the OSA starch is relatively low. We are talking about 1 to 2% uh, degree of substitution. Uh, so, so a relative, relatively low uh, number of hydrophobic moieties present. So back to the gamma arabic and the mesquite gum. Um, here are some A4 fractogams on the left. The top shows uh, gamma arabic, and below that we see the mesquite gum. Um, and the detector signal here is the uh, DRI signal, so concentration. And what we can see then in gamma arabic is that we have clearly two populations uh, visible here, while in mesquite gum we appear to have only one uh, population that we can see. The molar mass is relatively similar between the two, uh, from below uh, 100,000 up to about uh, 10 million. Uh, a benefit here is also that gamma arabic is, is known for being uh, difficult to separate with the SEC, but uh, it's rather uh, straightforward to perform this uh, separation using uh, AF4 instead. So we then wanted to investigate a little bit about the presence of the proteinaceous material, which then renders the material surface active. Uh, if we look at the total protein um, analysis of the samples we use, they are very similar in, in a total protein content. Um, but of course, the protein can also be present as, a, a, as an impurity um, and not necessarily associated with the uh, polysaccharide structure. Um, so what we did was a labeling of uh, the peptides in the polysaccharides, and we could then separate them uh, using A4, and in this case using uh, um, a fluorescence detector instead. Uh, and that's, these results are shown here. Here we have the molar mass on the x-axis, and here we have the fluorescence signal, which is then normalized against the RI signal, so normalized against the concentration. Uh, and what we could find is that for gamma arabic then, we can see that we have a rather uneven distribution of uh, protein in the polysaccharide fractions. Um, this is then the uh, population 1, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, which is then the arabinogalactan, and here we have the population 2, which is then the arabinogalactan protein, so the protein-rich part. And if we then compare to mesquite gum, we can see that the distribution is more even uh, over uh, the whole uh, distribution. 
so we don't have this distinct uh, difference. And also in the emulsion trials, it was obvious that uh, gamma arabic performed uh, much better as an emulsifier uh, than the mesquite gum, which gave a very poor uh, stability in the emulsions. And here are some results for the oil and water emulsions that we prepared. Um, so here we have uh, the aqueous phase of the emulsion. So we have made a, an oil and water emulsion, centrifuged it, uh, and removed the, the oil droplets as, as uh, intact oil droplets from the sample, and then injected it into the AF4. And this is then the multi-angle light scattering signal that we see here. The inset is a blow-up of uh, this part, uh, roughly here, of the fractogram. Uh, and here you can see then that we have our two populations again, and we then observed a decrease only in the arabine galactan protein part. So as we added uh, gamma arabic to our emulsion and performed the emulsification, uh, it was obvious that the uh, second population was selectively absorbed at the interface. So that's the population that is actually responsible for the emulsification, while the uh, population one, the arabino galactan peak, remains rather uh, unchanged. Uh, what we also saw uh, after emulsification, which is this trace here, um, was a large increase in the uh, uh, multi-angle light scattering uh, signal. We can compare here to before the emulsification. So we were wondering where this peak originated from that we didn't see originally. Um, we were thinking that it could be um, due to possible aggregation uh, during the emulsification of the gamma arabic or something similar to that. So hence we labeled the oil with a fluorescent dye, Nile red, um, in this case, and could then use a fluorescence detection on the a 4 again, and that is what is shown then on the right. Uh, and what we could then conclude is that we got a large fluorescence signal for uh, the um, uh, late diluting peak. Uh, this contains uh, then emulsion droplets uh, as we got this strong fluorescence signal from, from the uh, fluorescent dye. And their diameter is roughly around 800 to 900 nanometers, so very large uh, species that are present. So this also goes to show very neatly that in a single run we are able to separate out the arabino galactan uh, peak here, which if you remember then was uh, with a molar mass from around 100,000, and we can then go up to something so uh, as large as uh, very large, or uh, relatively large emulsion droplets, uh, which are 800 to 900 nanometers. And it goes to illustrate a little bit of the strength uh, of the methods in a, in a rather uh, simple uh, approach, and in, in one single run we were able to get uh, resolution between all these uh, analytes. Um, the OSA starch then, uh, we're similarly interested here in, in looking at absorption across uh, the size distribution. Um, so here we produced an emulsion that is shown here, and these are the emulsion droplets, and the red dots here then are to illustrate uh, the um, absorbed layer of the OSA starch. This is the uh, uh, molar mass distribution uh, in the uh, original emulsion um, of the aqueous phase, I should say, in the original emulsion. Uh, and we can then see that we have some intermediately large material here and a lesser material of really huge uh, starch polymers. We then do some gentle centrifugation. We get the emulsion droplets on top here. They cream, and we then still have our uh, dissolved uh, OSA starch here in the solution. So we could then evaporate the, the uh, emulsion, sorry, the oil phase, uh, and look at the uh, OSA starch that was present in this uh, part. And we can then compare that to the distribution down here, which is then taken from the aqueous phase after centrifugation. And interestingly, we then observe that it is uh, principally the very large, or I should say, 
the, principle, the, the very large material is overrepresented at the interface. So all this uh, huge uh, molar mass material here is absent in the aqueous phase, but it's found at the interface of the oil droplets. Um, and we went on and could describe this with a rather simplistic uh, uh, simulation uh, where we consider the convective transport of the emulsifiers to the interface in turbulent flow as this was produced by high pressure homogenization. Uh, and from the FFF data we could then, uh, we could compare the FFF data which are the, uh, the squares here in this plot with our uh, theoretical model. And the y-axis here shows the relative uh, absorbed amount in each molar mass class. Uh, and we can see that then when we are up to a very high molar mass up here, we get almost complete uh, absorption of, of this material, while it then uh, decreases as we go to lower molar masses. And the line then shows the, uh, uh, the model that we compare to that is on the equation on the right here, which basically is a collision uh, model between uh, the emulsifier, the oser starch, and the emulsion droplets in the homogenizer. And we see that we get a fairly good agreement uh, between the two. So in this, this way we were able to uh, understand how this absorption goes on and which was also uh, an interesting input data for the uh, process of how this uh, uh, hydrophobically modified starch should be uh, manufactured. So it's, it's uh, important in this case here to keep the large molar mass material because that will uh, uh, be uh, selectively absorbed at the interface and will then impair uh, a good colloidal stability to the emulsion. So the final uh, macromolecular emulsifier are oat proteins and um, these are interesting because they are used as an emulsifier in, in oat-based drinks which are made to be milk-like, similar to, to uh, soy drinks that are uh, as a milk replacer. Uh, and in the oats, when these uh, milk-like drinks are produced, they um, uh, act as uh, one of the most important emulsifying uh, agents. Um, one drawback of them is that they have a relatively poor heat stability, so we wanted to uh, investigate uh, a little bit uh, regarding this. And we can see here on the right, this is a um, uh, AF4 fractogram, uh, and it then shows that we have several different populations present. We have um, at lower retention times here we have some more uh, low molecular weight species, these are probably, uh, probably some of the uh, dissolved proteins, uh, and then we also have a much higher uh, molar mass uh, peak over here. And then finally uh, in this peak 3, three we have uh, an additional material. This material over here turned out to be uh, beta-glucan from the oats, so this was not related to the proteins, it was just beta-glucan that had not been eliminated in the uh, extraction step. Um, what was then done was that the um, oat protein fractions were collected and then analyzed by SDS page. Uh, and to our surprise we could see that many of the uh, monomeric proteins that we would expect in, in solution um, were then present over the size distribution in the FFF. So the STS page here is done uh, under denaturing conditions and reducing conditions, so we, we see the uh, monomeric species present. But if we compare it to the AF4, we can see that in, in as it would look in, in the native case, uh, it would be rather different. We would have the presence of large aggregated structures of this. And we can see that then over the size distribution that uh, the same proteins are present. So, in fact, in the actual oat protein solution that works as the emulsifier, the proteins are highly aggregated and, of course, this will, uh, is likely to, to influence their, their functionality. And that, uh, again, it can be misleading to, to analyze these uh, samples under 
uh, denaturing con uh, conditions. So again, it, it shows that uh, nicely that a 4 can be a valuable tool to, to investigate uh, such structures. Um, moving on uh, a little bit about uh, colloidal dispersions of lipids. And we start off with uh, low-density lipoprotein from egg yolk. Uh, the low-density lipoprotein in egg yolk is a triglyceride emulsion droplet, and it is covered uh, on the surface uh, by phospholipids uh, and lipo, sorry, proteins and uh, also cholesterol. It's an important um, substance if when we talk about the uh, stabilizing properties uh, of egg yolk, like in, for instance, uh, mayonnaise type, type um, emulsions. And uh, here on the left, we can see uh, extracted LDL from egg yolk. Um, we have one major peak here, which is the actual LDL uh, particles, which were confirmed by uh, electron microscopy. And we have a relatively small size of this. They're typically with a radius uh, of gyration of about uh, 20 nanometers. Uh, we also saw uh, a second peak, which we believe uh, which we are uncertain about the, the origin of. It could be uh, aggregates of the LDL that are present in our sample, uh, or it could be something else. Um, to increase the heat stability in these emulsions, which is desirable because we, we typically need to heat treat uh, our food in, in order to ensure a, a microbiological safety, um, we need to increase the um, ability of uh, our, our emulsifier, in this case, to, to be able to prevent the emulsion from uh, aggregating upon heating. Uh, and this is typically done in the industry by uh, treating the egg yolk with a phospholipase uh, uh, that removes one fatty acid from the phospholipids in the structure. Uh, this is well known, and it's known that it increases the heat stability, but the actual mechanism underlying this is still uh, uh, a, a point of discussion. Um, so we went on to look at how it would change the, the size distribution when we did this, what would happen uh, to the structure. Um, but first of all, we just wanted to see whether we could uh, see something about the, uh, the, the heating of the um, LDL. So here we have heated the LDL to different temperatures. Uh, so we have first here the 60 degrees for one hour, which is then very similar to um, the, the non-heat treated LDL, so not much happens. If we continue this for two hours, we can see that we are starting to see a growth here in the light scattering uh, response, so a formation of aggregates. And we could then also see that if we then increase the temperature further to 65 degrees and half an hour, that we get even a, uh, a larger uh, signal response here, so more aggregation of uh, the LDL. So we could basically uh, follow the uh, aggregation using uh, uh, AF4 mouse in this case. Um, we went on to PLA2 treat uh, our system, so we added the phospholipase enzyme, uh, and this is just the same figure uh, from the previous slide as I show here for of comparison. Um, it was interesting also to note that the, the PLA2 treatment did not disintegrate the LDL structure. So the LDL structure was uh, still appeared relatively intact after this treatment, uh, whereas one could speculate that it, it uh, would disintegrate uh, as, as this, um, uh, the structure of the phospholipids are changed. And we then again uh, heat treated our samples. So here we see uh, a heat treatment then at um, 65 degrees for half an hour, which is the black trace here. Uh, and if we compare that to the case where we have over here, we can see that this large aggr peak, aggregate peak is, is not present. Uh, so this nicely illustrates, again, the, the function of the PLA2 in, in, in um, preventing the aggregation of the LDL. And if we then continued at this little bit higher temperature, so we heat it for two hours, we can see that we start slowly to get uh, a growth uh, at longer retention times. Uh, so we have 
an, an increased signal there and an increased uh, aggregation of our species. So this gave us some valuable insight. These results are just recently published, uh, so we haven't had the time really to continue on this yet, but uh, it, it has been a good starting point for us to understand the uh, functionality and heat stability of uh, the LDL from egg yolk. Yes, so as I said, here we have the indication then of aggregate uh, formation and uh, in this case here, we have to heat for uh, a longer time to obtain uh, somewhat of an aggregation, but to a less extent than in the non-PLA2 uh, treated LDL. Um, we move on then to phospholipid vesicles. The vesicles is then a, a bilayer of phospholipids that is dispersed, so it's rolled up as it's shown on this uh, figure here on the right. Um, so these are the vesicles that we produced from a, a, a de-oiled uh, soil lecithin, so um, a technical uh, uh, product which then is a mixture of uh, uh, different types of phospholipids. Uh, the interest in this is that they're used as emulsifiers in food, uh, as well as in, in uh, pharmaceutical formulations and in uh, cosmetics. And in this case, we produce this by dispersing them uh, in, in water uh, and then running it through a high-pressure homogenizer when, we, when there we get a disruption of the lamellar phase and we then get these uh, lipid vesicles here nicely dispersed. Uh, this can be difficult to assess uh, in detail, um, but again, AF4 is a very suitable technique for this. Uh, if we again compare with size solution, uh, typically size solution offers some uh, problems when, when analyzing, or can offer some problems when analyzing these phospholipid uh, vesicles, as you can get absorption to the stationary phase and so on. And here is an example of two different uh, preparations. Um, we have then two different homogenization pressures here, uh, 100 megapascals and 20 megapascals in high pressure homogenizer, the dilution time again, uh, and here we have the refractive index signal, which are these solid traces here. So at um, a higher homogenization pressure, we can see that we have a peak that are shorter retention times. Uh, which then indicates a smaller size, and similarly at a lower homogenization pressure, we then have a much wider and spread out distribution, so a more polydispersed sample. And again, this is then confirmed by the mass detector when we determine the RMS uh, radius, uh, and we can see that in, in the case uh, of, of the high uh, homogenization pressure, we are down to here uh, close to the uh, limit of what we can determine, so below uh, 20 nanometers, moving down towards 10 nanometers. And at the lower homogenization pressure, uh, we have much larger vesicles that then uh, range up to about uh, 120 nanometers in RMS radius. And this could be nicely confirmed with uh, cryo-TEM, but what we were more uh, interested in was also to look at um, the structure of the vesicles that we have. So basically, if they're consisting of one uh, lamella, one bilayer of phospholipids, or if there are uh, a multi-lamellar structure present, we basically have several shells within each other. Um, and this shows then one of our preparations, again, the illusion time, and here we have uh, the um, ratio between the two radii, which gives us some information. So uh, this ratio should then be close to one if we have uh, a, a very thin shell and then a, a hollow particle, which in our case is, of course, filled uh, with water or the same uh, aqueous phase as we have on the outside of the vesicle. And if we then take this ratio, so we combine the results from the mass detector with the hydrodynamic radius that we obtain from AF4 theory, we get this solid trace here, so we get a value that is uh, nicely close to 1, 
Um, and we can then also, as this our spherical well-defined object, we can then calculate um, the hydrodynamic radius from the RMS radius. So we, we can compare with what we would calculate uh, the hydrodynamic radius from the radius that we obtain with the mouse detector. And we can see that we get a very nice agreement between the two here. Um, we have a dip here at lower values. Uh, and this is most likely due to that as the sizes of the vesicles become relatively small, the um, uh, thickness of the lamella starts to be uh, to influence the result. So I, I said that if for, for a very thin wall and a hollow sphere, we will get close to one, but as the uh, thickness of the uh, bilayer uh, becomes larger in comparison to the overall diameter of our, our uh, particles, then of course the, the, there is a deviation uh, from this uh, uh, expected value. And this were then confirmed with cryo2em, this is shown here on the left, where we can see that we have very nice unilamellar vesicles. Of course, the AA4 is, is a much faster and higher throughput than to prep uh, cryo2em and analyze uh, these micrographs. Uh, so, so it's again a, a valuable method for us to, to evaluate both the size and the properties of our preparations. Another interesting thing that can be measured is that we have sometimes uh, over the years in, in, uh, in my group and in neighboring groups as well observed these very long worm-like uh, uh, micelles in cryo-TEM. And in literature there has been quite some speculations what these are. Uh, and it was interesting to note that we could not find any support for this type of structures in, uh, in the field flow fractionation results. Uh, so it might be that these are uh, an artifact generated by the CryoTEM. Uh, difficult to be conclusive on this, but at least we could not find anything that would support that such structures uh, were indeed present in the sample. So finally, I will just say a little bit about uh, the spin-off company, Solve, which uh, relies heavily on A4 and, uh, uh, and uh, MALS, as well as SEC and MALS, but uh, we, we really specialize in A4. Um, and we were three uh, colleagues at different stages here at university uh, that founded this in 2012, and I'm happy to say that we are growing and having an increasing number of uh, uh, customers interesting, uh, interested in this. One of our uh, founders, Ray Runyon, has since we started uh, moved back to the to the US, where he is now in in Tucson, but he is still uh, active in the company. So what we can offer is contract uh, analysis. We have different uh, packages, and we are highly flexible uh, to do feasibility studies or uh, more comprehensive uh, characterization, and also. Uh, longer uh, contract uh, characterization of material. And uh, what we can work then is then many different types of species. We typically work with uh, proteins and nanoparticles, but also polysaccharides uh, and, and uh, other analytes uh, are, are uh, uh, handled by these guys. So the, the techniques that we typically use are then uh, SEC and AF4. Uh, multi-angle light scattering, and then we have other detection possibilities there as well. Uh, we also do a lot of DLS, dynamic light scattering, uh, for customers that satisfy with that, and um, also uh, now and then analytical ultracentrifugation, and other analytical techniques such as uh, LC and, and MS. Um, but we can thus offer a comprehensive uh, a characterization strategy based on these separation methods um, and can then assess different uh, properties such as the size distribution, molar mass distribution, present of aggregates uh, and, and other um, properties and also then of course uh, preparatively uh, separate samples with, with A4 to uh, further offline uh, analysis. So this is a uh, Example of protein characterization, a comparison between uh, SCC and AF4, um, where we have heat stressed uh, our IgG solution slightly, 
Um, and you can see here in the case of SEC, we have the blue trace, which is the differential refractive index, uh, where we can see here clearly the monomer and the dimer of IgG. And here we have the multi-angle uh, light scattering trace. So we can also see that we uh, appear to lose some material as we heat treat the, uh, the species. But if we compare to AF4, the elution order is then the opposite. So we have, instead of uh, large species eluting uh, before small species, we have the small species eluting first. So here we can see the uh, monomer trace of uh, the IgG, as well as um, the little shoulder here, which is the dimer. Uh, but most interestingly, comparing to SSC, is that we also get this very large uh, peak here, which are the aggregates that has formed as a result of, of heating, as compared to before here, when we did not have uh, any aggregates present in, in, um, in our solution. And these aggregates are then clearly absent here when we look in the uh, uh, SEC chromatogram. So it, it's a nice illustration of how a four are able to separate these large aggregates which are then uh, lost for one reason or the other in, in size exclusion chromatography. And finally, uh, some separations of nanoparticles. These are magnetic iron-based uh, nanoparticles. Um, uh, here is a dynamic, dynamic light scattering uh, plot down here, uh, and we can see that we have a distribution that ranges from yeah, perhaps uh, maybe a little bit above uh, 10 nanometers in diameter and up to a couple of hundred in this case here. And we have an average around, uh, or a peak here around 100 nanometers. Uh, when we went on to take this same sample and separate it by A4, we could then see that we had uh, several different uh, uh, fractions present. Uh, we have a large peak here close or in the void, so an unseparated peak that dilutes uh, very rapidly, that is not retained. Uh, we have another population over here which has relatively low light scattering, so small material. Uh, and then um, Another peak here, which we do obtain light scattering signal for and can determine the RMS radius here. So then we are below 20 nanometers in RMS radius down here. And then in low concentration, but then uh, considerably larger, uh, we have uh, considerable light scattering signal uh, and we can then determine the RMS radius uh, nicely here. So from the uh, very wide, um, broad size distribution, we can then, uh, by fractionating the samples, really uh, see what is present there. Um, and of course, then as we uh, transform this um, results here into an hydrodynamic diameter through uh, um, the theory of AF4, so calculating the hydrodynamic diameter from elution times, we can then see that in fact we have uh, a bimodal uh, distribution present here. Uh, and we can also see that the, the uh, uh, small material here is underestimated in the DLS because the uh, contribution to the intensity of the scattered light is so large from the larger particles. But by fractionating the sample and determining it on the uh, fractions as they elute from the channel, we can in fact see that we have this uh, clear bimodal distribution. Um, and it is also clear to see that because of the high intensity of this large material here, we get an uh, overestimation of the, the uh, width of the distribution upwards. Whereas in, in uh, AF4, we can see that there are uh, very little, uh, in fact, present of this uh, material. Uh, and what we think is going on here is that the uh, peak close to the void is in fact coating. Uh, there is a polymer coating of these particles that has, uh, is not attached to the particle surface anymore and it's hence eluted uh, in the void. Um, and this large peak that we see here is in fact aggregates of the individual nanoparticles that are present in the sample. Whereas you could uh, be led to believe in this case that it was simply uh, uh, 
uh, a presence of, of large particles, but they are in fact uh, aggregates of individual particles. So finally, uh, I would just like to thank some people that have contributed to all this work. Uh, professor Bjorn Bangstol, who is the professor of our group, and my grad students, um, which are here in this picture. Uh, the guys at Solve Research and Consultancy, uh, also here in Lund, and the good work they do. And then uh, some of my academic collaborators, Andreas Haukansson at Kristianstad University, uh, and in Bolivia, Mauricio Peñareta. Um, Professor Seng Hu Lee at Hanam University in Korea, which I have had a very fruitful collaboration with. Uh, and the same goes for uh, Alben Alero at the Leibniz Institute in Dresden, in Germany. And also Professor Myung Hee Moon in, uh, at Yonsei University in Korea. And uh, I will uh, leave you with some pictures of uh, Lund here as it looks in, in summer, and I would also like to thank uh, Wire Technology for giving me the opportunity of giving this webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Nielsen, and we will now wrap up the webinar. If you have any questions regarding this presentation, please email us at marketing at wyatt.com. Wyatt's on-demand webinar library is a great resource where you can find recordings covering many additional aspects of light scattering technology and applications. Thanks again for joining us, and this now concludes our webinar for today.